think of when you think of uh, God's word and as you go to God in prayer, it's always important to go to God in prayer with promises. Uh, many times our, the promises go uh, just by the wayside because we don't think about those promises. So, if you had to think about a promise that you'd like to share with the, the other group in the group this morning, what promises come to mind right off the bat? I'll just relate something that happened recently. It didn't really happen to me, but I had a lot of meditation for a morning lady who was going to drive on the interstate, and I took her to her daughter's in uh, Orlando. Okay, well, I took her this past Thursday. She seemed fine. Well, I received a phone call yesterday, and she did ill. Why? Well, she actually did. Yeah. And yeah. if you go to the doctor, you know what her problem is, but she ate, she did not even want to call, like she was terrible. promise that goes with that yeah. truth that you just told. Give me a give me a promise from God's word that would go with all, that. All things will work for the good for those who promise. That's a good quotation. Exactly Where's that found, found, Sam? I'll give you a dollar if you can tell me where it's found. You what? I'll give you a dollar if you can tell me where that's found. What song? Where it's found. What word what It's Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. So, Sam. Mark, right? yeah. <laughs> Romans 8, 28. Sam, get surprised for that. Who's got another one? Mary. And where's that found, Mary? Yeah, James 1. Five through eight. Five. Yep. I don't know the reference, but uh, when, when Sam was talking, I thought in the world you will have tribulation, but they are not going to come to Ah. John sixteen thirty three, right? Well, uh, he will never leave us. There is nothing, no power that can pluck us out of his hand. Oh, that's actually two verses you did. So, he'll never leave us or forsake us, that we may boldly say the Lord is our helper. He leaves in Romans 8, right? Uh, yeah, you, the first one you were talking about is Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. And uh, the second one is Romans 8. Uh, what? 38, 39. But I think what you had reference to was John 10. Um, Romans 8, yeah, you're, you're right, 38, 39, that's the one that always comes from. Yeah. Okay, that's good. These are good promises. Anybody else have any? Philippians 6. Whoa, I love it. He's here on that day. <laughs> can you close that? I'm sure of this, that you can keep me down the road from the over to finish that day in Jesus Christ. Ah, yes, what very good. Say, what did she say? She said, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, which happens to be the focal point of my sermon this morning. Which said what? I can quote it in King James. She, she quoted it in the ESV. But, uh, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So God's working in you. He's the one that started it. He's going to complete it. That's what it's all about. Thank you, Rebecca. She's, pre she's preparing for the sermon this morning. Anyone else have a promise from God's word? Hold on. Hold on, Sam. All right. Psalm 
uh, 86 and verse 15. All right. Who else? Well, this is outside, but you convicted me. Okay. I hope I didn't. Ask me about what scripture was, because I'm I'm on the line. Okay, when I read the Bible, if something impresses me, etc., I'm on the line. And Romans 8:28 is on the line. And okay. It's okay. Okay. And you convicted me in the sense of I think it's a whole not on the line. Yeah, it goes. Because then it's always there. You well, can I think. Go through my whole Bible and look at all the things I underline. Uh, Romans eight twenty four. For hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Well, why does one hope for what is seen? Very good. But I, I, oh, it's impressive. But I can't remember. Here's a cool one. Uh, this is Peter's writing a book of the Bible. And he's considering a promise of another book of the Bible. The promise within a promise. Kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, Peter says, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's from Isaiah 66, probably his word. Yeah. So what was the quotation of Peter? It was... It's uh, 2 Peter 3.13. Yeah. The new heavens and the new earth. Very good. What else? Anybody else? It's not, not like this. Hold on, hold on. Mark. Uh, I have a promise from the Greek from Worry if we ask about it. Oh, yes? Can you quote it for me? Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing but through supplication and prayer with thanksgiving. Make the request made known to God and the peace of God and the request of all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I knew I could count on you, Bruce. <laughs> All right. What were you going to say, Blair? Um, John 17, I appreciate the idea that Christ is for us. Yeah. Um, it, it's just... Lovely. And we know it's for us because he said, not only do I pray for these, but also those who would believe on you through them. Exactly. And that's us. All right. I, I won't forget that one because quite then, obviously, I get anxious about things from time to time. That's my... Your go-to verse. Very good. All right. Before we dig into Mark chapter 10, everybody turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 33, 3. Old J.R. used to say this is God's telephone number. Jeremiah 33, 3. If you don't know this one, I would encourage you to memorize it. It is a, an encouragement to pray. Jeremiah 33, 3. You know it already, Rebecca? It's on the line. Uh, I knew I could count on you. She could probably quote it right now. Jeremiah 33 3. It's an underline, Bob. It's an underline. Well, there, then memorize it. Here we go. Go over me and I will answer you. I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. All right, that's, that is a promise from God. You call, I'll answer, and I'm going to show you more than you could ever ask or think. Okay, that's God saying that. Jeremiah just wrote it as God was speaking to him. So if you need an encouragement to pray, it's Jeremiah 33, verse 3. All right, good on the promises. We're going to talk about the promise of God today. To turn in your Bibles, or follow on the outline of Mark chapter 10. Uh, interesting thing that happened. We'll, we'll break this one down and talk about how it applies to us as well. So, Mark chapter 10. All right, let's just read the passage, Mark 10, verses 28 through 34. Uh, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly, truly, or truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. And they were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed that those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them that 
what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. We're following the commentary by J.C. Ryle, and J.C. Ryle breaks this down into three parts, and the first one is to talk about the glorious promise in verses 28 and uh, to 30. A glorious promise that uh, speaks, of, first of all, what Jesus promises us if we're really devoted followers of him. We'll notice that in that promise, they also have been promised some persecution, but he also promised to take care of us. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first of all, I put on your outline, what's up with Peter's statement? Peter made the statement, see, we have left everything and followed you. Why would Peter say that? In the context of what just happened, you had the young ruler who Jesus said, you need to give up your worldly wealth and follow me, and he couldn't do it. Right. And Peter was pointing out, maybe pridefully, look, we've given up everything. We're following you. What about us? Yeah, exactly. You know, there's some time, that, that's a good point, because sometimes people who are following the Lord Jesus Christ wonder, because of the, prompt, the prompting of the, the evil one, is it really worthwhile? Especially if you are going through persecution. Especially if you're going through a hard time, you know, and, well, let's just put it, you're trying to be living with integrity and do things right, and you have your neighbor who's not, and you're struggling and they're not, and the first thing is, is it really profitable, is it right to serve God? I mean, that creeps through our minds all the time. So, uh, right here, Peter says, hey, we've, we're following you. We have given up everything to follow you. So, what, what does it say about Peter? Blair mentioned maybe his pride stood up and said, hey, we're doing this. I think he might have been questioning a little bit about, uh, you know, maybe what, we're not, you know, they, they probably, as we've talked about, they were probably looking for Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom then, and they were going to rule and reign with him and have special places. You know, John and James, their mother even came and said they, they would like the right hand and the left hand, you know, when Jesus set up his kingdom. So the question is, uh, how, would a, how, how do we identify with Peter? What is Peter really saying? Materially, they don't want something materially right now, and and probably that's the appeal of the prosperity gospel. Okay, um, I was talking to Camilo, uh, who's now coming to our church. He's from Colombia, and he was saying that in Colombia, the vast majority of preaching going on is prosperity gospel, which is true. Prosperity gospel has hit the African continent and the Latin American continent, and they have, they appeal to them because there are many poor people, and so. They, they strike that blow and say, if you follow Jesus, you're going to have houses and lands and things, all these things that, that promise, but that's not really promised in the gospel. So let's break this down. Look at verses 29 to 30. Uh, how do verses 29 and 30 connect with Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27? Would everybody turn there? Luke 14, 26 and 27. One more quick thing on Peter's statement. I, I was sitting here thinking about it. It almost sounds like he's concerned. Like he heard what Jesus said and he's like concerned for himself. Okay. And he's like, uh, well, we've done that right. Like, uh, pretty sure me. That, that's, a, that's a good point. Maybe he, was, he thought that you know, they left all and we just want to make sure he was on. Yeah, like, Did we do the right thing? Are we, are we in this? We're not like that's, that. Right. That's a good point. That's kind of balancing whatever. Because the first thing we get, because Peter does have a sense of pride and as the old preacher said, that Peter does have a way of sticking both feet in his mouth and wondering why he can't walk very well, you know? So, uh, but he is speaking up, and that's a good way, good point, Nick, that he could have been saying, you know, are we, are we doing this right? All right, someone, uh, Blair, you have Luke 14, 26, and 27. Would you read those, please? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sister, but yes, even his own life, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, and 
Uh, okay, so let's just break this down because we're going to go back to verses uh, 29 through 30 in a moment but here, but let's just connect these dots. Uh, how does Jesus' statement to Peter then come back to Luke chapter 14, 26 and 27? Well, first of all, let's ask, what is Jesus demanding in Luke? What is Jesus saying? If you're going to be a follower of mine, here's what it's going to take. Rejecting all family and friends and following him. Yeah, so he has to be number one. Right? He's number one. Okay, so that means everything, other, every other relationship. Okay, now... I don't believe he's teaching as those cults teach you that you have to go home and spit on your parents or whatever else. But if they're pulling you back, okay, if they're taking you away, you deny that relationship to follow Jesus. That's what he's saying. Yeah, and, and often you don't have to um, completely abandon them because that might not be what the situation requires, but it, it just means you don't obey them, you don't listen to them. Right. You do what God says first, and if that ruins the relationship, well, you have to deal with that. Right. So the, the point is, following Jesus costs everything. Everything else is inferior to this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, all of your mind, all of your heart, all of your strength, follow me. You have to be all in. And if anything else is pulling you back, you, you, and notice he even says, what's the last part of verse uh, that you read there, Blair? Even his own life. Yeah. Okay, even your own life. You have to be willing to take up your cross, to deny yourself, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not that he's picking on father, mother, sister, brother, whatever. He's just saying, this is so, so superior here. Now, how does that apply then to what Jesus is saying to the promise here says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time of houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. How does that compare? Yeah, exactly. This is worth it. I'm demanding this from you but I want to assure you that it is worth it. It reminds me of when Jesus says, give and you shall receive. Well, that's, you know, can apply to your funds, but also to give your life and you'll receive a hundredfold. Yeah. It's, wor it's worth it if you give your life. Okay. Uh, what about Mark 3, 31 through 35? How does that connect? Let's turn there at Mark 3, 31 through uh, 35. Someone has call it out. Mark 3, 31 to 35. And his mother and his soft brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about, the brothers stood around him and said, Okay, now let's connect the dots to what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 10. Okay, what is the promise? We'll break down that promise in more detail, but how does it connect? The, uh, the whole idea, it's an all or nothing proposition. Right? Okay. It's, um, and it, it's a little staggering for us to think about truly. Always reminds me of that, that little quote from Jim Elliott, who was a missionary who was still on the mission field. Mm -hmm. A famous little quote is that says, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's uh, really what we're talking about here. Okay. Well, Otherwise, uh, uh, let's, let's keep connected. I think we're talking. Very good. The, the t 
ties in Christ supersede blood ties. Okay? It supersedes that. I always remember this, a, uh, this preacher, I was in a meeting one time, the preacher was talking about his brother who was also a preacher, and he called him his double brother. Because he had the, the blood ties, but he also had the spiritual ties. And quite frankly, we, we lose sight of this because we go to church. We don't understand the connections that we have in church that we're supposed to have. That means the connections that Blair and I have supersede the ties with his brothers or his sister. And that means that it's when we come to church that we have such good connection because we have fellowship in the gospel, that that fellowship in the gospel is better than blood ties. But so many times in America we have made the relationship with Christ, me and Jesus, that's it, very personal. Remember, people talk about a personal Savior. Well, we're drawn into community when we're saved. The community is the, ch the local church. And we should look at that, that we care more about these people than we do in our own family. But what happens is so many times it's pushed aside the meeting of the church for family gatherings. This is important. We're to understand this is the ties that we have. It grow, runs deeper than blood. Okay? And that's what Jesus is saying here. Let's go back to the promise in Luke chapter, or Mark chapter 10, when Jesus said, um, Truly I say, no one here has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold, now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come eternal life. Let's break it down. What is Jesus promising? Let's break down what he what is he promising. The first thing he promises is what? Deeper relationships. Okay? Deeper relationships. Uh, I just say I was first ordained in ministry in 1983. And we went to uh, served a little church in Jacksonville, Florida, from Cincinnati, we moved from Cincinnati, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's like we were losing, we were away from our kin folks and, never, and even our friends back in Cincinnati, and now we're in a new place. And we, blew, we, we have served churches, I've served churches in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, Del Arc, Arkansas, outside of Arkadelphia. I've served churches in Jackson, Mississippi, and and uh, wherever we have gone, we've connected with people. And so those people, the relationships we have with believers all over the country are deeper than our own blood relationships. And God has provided for us. When God calls us to go somewhere, no matter where we go, the first place we need to connect is the church. The first place we need, we need that stability in the church. We need that relationship. And the Bible tells us they need you. It's two-way street. We're part of a body. He doesn't say that, you know, it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about the fact that we're part of a body, right? And the, so we're members all one another. That's not, we don't find that in a family, in a relationship, with brothers and sisters, and, you know. So here we have, this is a very important relationship. So he promises relationship. What else in that promise does he give to us or tell us we're going to have? Well, first, yeah, houses and lands, okay? What does that speak of? He's going to take care of our needs, right? God promises to take care of our needs. When we're focused on giving to him everything, he's going to take care of our needs. Sometimes we hold back because we're afraid he's not going to provide for us. And that's why most people that don't give in the church don't give because they're afraid to act in faith and give, knowing that God's promised to give back. God's promised to take care of your needs when we act in faith. Isn't that why? You know, so they, they trust their money more than God is what is so that happens. But God promises to take care of our needs. You know? um, Bob, it, it brings to mind the book of Acts in the early church. Okay. Um, how 
they contributed, gave to the church, and through that, their needs were taken care of. They, they were a family uh, taking care of one another. There's a promise about that in the book of Philippians. <laughs> Does anybody know that promise? Because Paul commends the church at Philippi, which is also known in 2 Corinthians as the church of Macedonia. Okay, He commends them for giving, and then he, he commends them in the book of Philippians chapter 4. He talks about the fact that they, they dug up their funds and sent it by Epaphroditus to him. And then he makes this quotation. This is a wonderful promise of God. My Lord will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory. Is that it? By Christ Jesus. That's exactly right. Philippians 4.19. So if you need a good scripture to, to go on, okay, to really encourage you, Philippians 4.19 is that scripture. All right? So, let's, let's go on here. The, 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 God has provi provi pro uh, promoted that. Yes, sir? Um, okay. Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you. I just have a choice. Yeah, if you, if you want to have a seat, we're in the middle of class right now. I mean, uh, was there any way? I, I'm, I'm living on a time frame. Can I talk to you real quick? Just take two minutes. I'm sorry. I would not do this if I didn't want to do that. I can't really do anything without another detail. Can I ask what the situation is real quick? I have a two-year-old over here. It's a very small issue. Where she might join him. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, what else does Jesus promise there in that passage? Well, deeper relationship, taking care of our needs, okay? And what else? There's two other things. He promises that we will have persecution. Isn't that interesting? Because most... You don't hear that from prosperity gospel preachers, do you? They said, God's going to provide all this. Well, okay, God will provide deeper relationships when you're ready to, to sacrifice everything to follow Him. God is going to provide how to uh, take care of your needs. God's also going to allow you to be persecuted. There's a scripture in Philippians chapter 1 about that. Does anybody know that one? We're not there yet in Philippians. <laughs> Philippians 1, verse 27. Philippians 1, verse 27. Anybody know that one? You know, I haven't learned that one yet, Rebecca? Okay, well, we'll get there in a few weeks. Okay, Philippians 1, verse 27. Not only has it been given to you on behalf of Christ to believe in Him, but also to... Anybody know that? Oh, 129. 29, thank you. Um, unto you is granted uh, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Oh, notice the gift. It's a gift, right? What's, what's twofold gift? Not only one believing, you're believing God is a gift. Is there another scripture like that anybody knows? Maybe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Right? Okay, Ephesians 2.89, that by grace you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is what? A gift of God. Your faith, your believing is a gift, but also, he says, your suffering is a gift. In Philippians chapter 1. So, Jesus says part of this promise is to be persecuted, and also part of the promise is what? The last, the last phrase. Eternal. Eternal life. Wow. So, what would you say? Is that is it worth following Jesus and giving up everything? Is it worth saying, I'll turn my back on everything else and follow him? When he says, I'll give you deeper relationships with what you're giving up. I'll take care of your needs. Oh yeah, I'm going to give you persecutions. That's going to make you stronger. But, I'll also uh, give you eternal life. Okay. Um... Uh, we, we covered the next segment, what Jesus sees. Well, let's just, no, 
what is uh, part of this promise? I, I kind of broke it down another way. Part, part of this promise, that next thing on your outline, uh, what is the promise all about? It's the very fact that Jesus sees and he rewards. The Lord Jesus Christ sees and rewards. There are several scriptures here that I'd like to just hit with, but let's just look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. You never have to wonder whether the Lord Jesus Christ takes notice of the fact that you're giving up to follow, which you're giving up to follow. He will never, never, never not see it. And he will never just look over it. Let's look at some simple point in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. Who has that? Okay, what could be harder, what, what could be simpler, excuse me, what could be simpler than just handing someone a cup of water in the name of Jesus Christ? That wouldn't be really cost you, would it? But Jesus says, that may seem like a small thing, but he takes notice of it. He'll, he'll reward you accordingly. So if that's going to take, if he's going to do that for small things, what will we do for larger things? Um, We need to move on here, so let's just go on to the next point. Solemn warning here. Verses 31 and 32 of uh, Mark chapter 10. Uh, J.C. Ryle called this next point a very important point. It's a solemn warning. Notice the words are, For many who are first will be last, and, and the last first, and they who were on the, and they were on the road to Jerusalem, Jesus was walking ahead of them, they were amazed. Um, and those who followed him were afraid, and he began. Then the twelve began to tell him. Uh, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. That was in the last part of verse 32. All right. So, uh, against what is Jesus warning? Pride. 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 Yeah. Um, I call this the secret deceit of the disciples. Do we ever have that problem, with pride? How does it show up? How does pride show up? Probably boasting, I would guess. Okay. Well, let's just write that down. Boasting. Give me an example of how that would show up in the church, boasting. Oh, I did this for somebody. They oh, okay. Yeah, you make it known that you, what you did in secret, but you, you know, let, let it be known. Very good. What's that? Teach Sunday school. That's that's way of pride to teach Sunday school. What you said, boasting. Oh, oh, if you were boasting, oh, you were teaching. Oh, you were. Oh, going around telling people I teach Sunday school. Okay, I'm sacrificing. I teach Sunday school. Well, I taught Sunday school when I was younger, so I don't need to be doing that now. I'm holy. I've heard that. Yeah, that happens. All right. How else do people boast? Or express pride in churches. Now, never, never tell anybody that you're fasting when you're fasting. Uh, now, if you're fasting for medical purposes, you know you could probably talk about it. Didn't that, that doesn't blow that. But if you're fasting for spiritual purposes to get close to God, as soon as you tell somebody, you've blown it. So you may as well quit. Okay. Um, so, so it's interesting if you listen to my podcast, my friend JT and I do the podcast together, and one day he just said, you know, before we started, he said, I'm really worn, run down today, and I said, oh yeah, what's going on? He says, I can't tell you. <laughs> I, said, I, I just deduced from, because we had had the conversation the week before that if you, if you went around bragging about your fast, and you just had blown it. Again, so I can't tell you. I said, well, then I can't help you, so there you go. <laughs> well, the thing, I mean, sometimes the pride yeah. comes out as feeling like we have to uh, accomplish a certain amount or uh, live at a certain level uh, as, you know. Oh, 
Oh, to make impression. Yeah, kind of a, almost a keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing. Uh, okay, so we're going to make impression. Yeah. So, and certainly that's not, you know, looking nice to come to church, but if you were looking nice to say, I want to look nice to yeah. make sure that you know, Nick doesn't look nicer than me today. So. It could also be when you do a task or something for the church one. Like, you came in and you painted that wall right there. And nobody said thank you. You would feel slighted. Because you want to be recognized. Yeah. You shouldn't have to say thank you. Exactly. Yeah, so Paul says to work heartily as to the Lord. Yeah. If you're working for the Lord, you wouldn't, you wouldn't care as much if. Uh, well, you know, he takes some. You know, he takes notice, even yeah. nobody else does. He's, you know, he's watching. Yeah. Very good. So, the disciples always had this problem that, you know, I'll, I'll give you the reference, Mark 9, 33 to 37, and Mark 10, 35 to 40, that, the, that um, both times the disciples had this secret desire to be number one. Okay? And the disciples were, were talking among themselves about that. They often were, uh, I'm sure... We have so, just a couple of accounts of it, but it, it probably was rampant among them. And you know why? I mean, you get around a bunch of guys, what is happening? It's always trying to establish a peck order. Competition. It's competition. You know, it's like um, uh, yesterday I was with a group of guys that we went over to San Antonio to ride hills. And it's amazing how when we were riding the hills that you know, we'd all come up to the hill together but the guys that really wanted to show off sprinted up the hill. You know, it's almost like they were going for the king of the mountain, yeah? Yeah. I have to admit that I tried to do that on the first couple of hills, and afterwards I was so worn out. I said, that was a dumb thing to do. I just needed to pace myself the whole time. But I found myself in the trap, and that's what happens. We, we do. We push our own agendas. We get mad when people aren't following our agenda, or if somebody doesn't do something like we think we're that uh, um, they should be doing. All right, the question is, why does this bother Jesus so much? Why does our expression of pride and boasting, why does that really get under his skin? Because you'll notice he, he, it got under his skin with the Pharisees and even his own disciples. He couldn't stand it when they were expressing such pride. Why do you think that is? What's that? That Okay. What were you saying, Sam? Well, so are we. Yeah, we're stone heads too. What were you saying, Bruce? It's interesting that Jesus was, was teaching oneness of the disciples, right? And he, was, he showed them what true humility was like. I mean, even as he went to the cross, turn to Philippians chapter 2, by the way. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Um, but Jesus was teaching this, and he was showing, showing them this, and they were so caught up in their own agendas that they weren't really listening because they were really pushing themselves. It's kind of like Christ comes to because we can't believe unless we've been chosen unless the Spirit can start up. And so he's, he's preaching all these people and he's trying to share with them. But in reality, unless they've been touched. Right, they wouldn't get it, but he's also putting down the, the pride of the Pharisees, and quite frankly, in this case, he's putting down the pride of the disciples who had been touched by the Spirit of God and followed Jesus, you know. So Jesus was straightening them out. So I look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Somebody read that, please. Dave, do you have that? So oh, there's okay. any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, 
Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Each, each one of you, but not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Okay, so he's looking for oneness. And how does it demonstrate it? We look for the needs of others more than our needs. And that goes back to giving ourselves totally to him. We look to the needs of others more than our needs. He'll take care of us. We don't have to look after our own needs. He'll take care of us. Um, one last thing, then, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, foreknowledge of his suffering, verses 32 through 34, uh, why did he constantly talk about that, and why didn't they get it, and what is the essential to the kingdom? Why is this essential to the kingdom? You can answer that pretty quickly, I'm sure, but let's just say, why do you constantly talk about it? Let me ask you a question. How important is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to the, the gospel going forward? It's, the reason. it's everything, it's right? It is the gospel. So Jesus talked about it. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die at the hand of the Gentiles. But I'm going to rise again from the dead. And they said, no, no, no. So they didn't get it all the time. But he constantly talked about it. Okay, so why didn't they get it? Exactly, at, at least, you know. So why didn't they get it? They were still looking for that earthly kingdom. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for something to satisfy them, and they saw him dying as taking away from from what they were looking for him to do. That's not what they learned in, in their Jewish preschool, right? Or elementary school, or whatever. <laughs> that's not why. That's not how they were catechized. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so why is this essential to the kingdom? Isn't that why Jesus came? And that's why he's, that's why he's exalted, because he came to do the job and he did it. So um, God has exalted him to be king of kings and lord of lords. This is, this is step one. You know, he inaugurated the, the kingdom and his coming and his death for a resurrection. Now we look forward to the final day when it's all fulfilled at the end he comes again. Amen. And for, on that note, we will close. Encourage you to read, continue to read in Mark chapter 10, because... Uh, David is going to pick that up next week where we left off. And uh, so come prepare to study God's Word with our brother Dave Hildebrand next week.